Welcome to this special episode of The Guilty Feminist from the top of City Hall with the actual real-life mayor of the original London. Yes, I'm Deborah Francis White, and I'm with mayor and feminist Sadiq Khan. So, Sadiq, I imagine you're a fan of the show, yeah. but in case you don't know this, we always start with this game, which is I'm a feminist, but where we sort of exfoliate something that we think might be a paradox with our feminism. So, for example, I'm a feminist, but... One time I went on a women's rights march here in London, here in your city, our city of London, and I popped into a department store on Oxford Street to use the loo. But while I was in there, I got distracted trying out face cream. And when I came out, the march was gone. Oh dear. Um, so do you have, and I'm a feminist, Bart Sadiq, is there anything that you think is a slight paradox? Well, can I say, firstly, I, I love the women's planning. So thanks for explaining to me. Uh, I'm really grateful. Um, you know, <laughs> reinforce all the stereotypes you have about us men, but no, no, I'm only joking. I'm only, I'm only joking. Listen, Look. it's fine because the power structures don't support it when I patronise you. <laughs> so it's all good. Do you remember those awful adverts about the Yorkie bar? Mm, yes. Well, I'm a feminist, but I prefer Yorkie bars to Galaxy all day long. Wow. You heard it here first, Guilty <laughs> Feminist listeners. Sadiq Khan continues to support the Yorkie Bar despite their sexist they advertising. Pretty tasty. I mean, and they fill a hole. They fill a hole. You, and exactly. I'm little. And, if, and you, look how little I am. And, it, you know, they, they fill a big well, hole. You get to that three o'clock point. You're running a city. You're running one of the most famous cities in, in the world, if not the most famous city in the world. You're thinking, uh, and oh. And the greatest. Uh, and the greatest. The greatest city in the world. Yeah. You're running the greatest city in the world. Don't tell Lynn manuel Miranda that. Famously, Hamilton. The greatest city in the yeah. world. You're running this great city. You Three o'clock, you're about to crash. No, the Yorkie. The, York, the Yorkie. The Yorkie. Honestly, I don't drive a lorry, but, you know, uh, being the mayor of London is uh, quite taxing. And so Yorkie does a business, honestly. Except, well, there you go. That's your feminist paradox. But you are doing an extraordinary amount for women. You've got a new campaign here in London. Hashtag behind every great city. And that refers to the old turn of phrase. Some of my listeners are Gen Z. They won't know it. Behind every great man is a woman. Yeah, I mean, it was a feminist slogan in the 70s, I think. It's a bit dodgy, though, when you think about it. Behind every great man mm. is, is, is woman. It, well, exactly. It was it's a, a play on that. And we're playing around with that. And you actually, the point we're trying to make is, you know, women drive this great city. Behind every great city is equality, is opportunity, is progress. And actually, this year in this country, we commemorated 100 years since the first women got the right to vote in 1918. So what we wanted to do this year in 2018 was to commemorate 100 years since the first women got the right to vote, celebrate the progress of many women breaking down barriers, doing amazing things, but also to commit to redouble our efforts to end gender inequality. And so the point is to celebrate the successes and you met and you interviewed many great women, great Londoners, but also to realise we've got to do much, much more. And you know, if in the most progressive city in the world, if in London, we still have massive gender inequality. We still have women suffering disproportionately high amounts of violence against them and girls as well. If it's still the case that if you're born a girl in London, your life chances, I'm afraid, are less than if you're born a boy, we're going to make rapid progress. And so this, that's what this year is about. But also, it's not just this year. We're going to build on this every year while I continue to be the mayor. Wow. Well, you will continue to be mayor if you talk like that. Because <laughs> all the London guilty feminists, they're coming out then, they're coming out to vote for you, Sadiq. So... Behind every great city is the women that make it, but it feels like you're trying to say ahead of every great city and make sure that women are in more high-profile roles, there's more representation. I read about our time on your website, sure. and it says here, research shows that positions of power in every sector of society are dominated by men. Currently, women make up just seven FTSE 100 CEOs, seven out of 100, none of whom are BAME. Only 32% of council chief exec positions, 26% of charity CEOs. So you're trying to do something about that and change the numbers. There are more women in leadership roles. What are you doing? How can we help? Well, so firstly, can I say some of the things said to me when I became mayor, when I you know, explained that it's a bit odd, uh, the lack of women in top positions is there aren't talented women. And I just find that offensive. And my response was, you're looking in the wrong places, you're mixing with the wrong people. And so I'm really proud in the last two years, uh, we've appointed the first... Commissioner of the Met Police Service. She's a woman. She's brilliant, by the way, Cressida Dick. The first ever Commissioner of the London Fire Brigade, Danny Cotton. She's brilliant as well. By the way, both of them are the best people for the jobs and they happen to be women. More than half of the deputy mayors of this great city, the greatest city, are uh, women. More than half of my business advisory board are uh, women. And it's really important that we realise there are talented women there. But sometimes they haven't got the access that uh, talented men have. And so we've set up our time. And what our time is about is, it's a bit more than mentoring. Mentoring is very important. I mentor a lot of people. 
it's more akin to sponsorship and then coaching, where basically the idea is we get women who are on the cusp of senior leadership positions, match them up with either a senior woman or a senior man to give them proper sponsorship and assistance between six and 12 months to give them the networks, the coaching, the support they need to be ready for the top jobs. And you and I both have met confident blokes who may not have the skill set. They'll apply for things. They'll put themselves forward. Whereas we'll have also met women who are very talented, as talented if not more, who are not as confident to do so. We've got to, we've got to address that. I routinely meet men, Sadiq, who do not have the skill set and still put themselves forward. Exactly. Have you noticed who's running the United States of America at the moment? <laughs> it's not just men with skill sets that just walk into rooms going, yep, I reckon oh, no. I've got this covered. We're constantly messaged as women that we shouldn't put ourselves forward or we've got to be twice as good. Absolutely. And all of that stuff, I think, plays into the mentoring tradition. What I think happens is that women get like a remedial style mentoring. It's like, oh, we'd like to encourage you to go into leadership. And then you're made to feel like you're not as good as a man yeah. or you you need confidence training. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's nothing to make you feel less confident than someone, Somebody say that. someone saying, well, no. do you know what you need is to be more confident. That's designed to sap your confidence. And I think men are given Top Gun academies. So it's you're the best of the best, we're going to make you better. Yeah. And I think what it sounds like you're doing with... Our time. Our time. I wanted to say time's up, but that's a very different thing. No, no. Um, our time is you're creating a Top Gun Academy where women feel they're getting this because they're brilliant yeah. and then you're developing them to be brilliant. And it's, it's basically it's about managing talent. There are talented women in City Hall, in Transport for London, in the Met Police Service, in the London Fire Brigade, uh, things that are responsible for. And history tells us they've not been given the opportunities, the helping hand, or that sort of Top Gun Academy mm. assistance that we know some mediocre blokes have and have reached the top positions. And I'm not against blokes, by the way. You know, I'm one myself. Some of my best friends are white blokes. But it's about realising... Some of my favourite husbands <laughs> are white men, Sadiq. Um, but it's about realising, actually, it can't be right. There's a great, uh, you know, Malali Zafzai, uh, who, who won the Nobel Prize of Pakistani origin, now a Brit. She's got this great phrase which she used in her speech when she got the Nobel Prize where she said we can't all succeed if half are held back and the point I've tried to do is mainstream this so we've got a mainstream feminism we've got a mainstream why it's important to address this issue there's a, there's a report done last year by a member of our business advisory board Vivian Hunt she works for McKinsey's and they actually quantified the benefits to business by being more diverse and having more women in top positions. I mean, just think about this. In 2018, in London, the most progressive city in the world, there are more FTSE 100 chief execs called David or Steve than there are women. It just, it just, it's mind-boggling when you think about it. It's absolutely astounding. And I worry that the suffragettes 100 years ago would have assumed that in 100 years that would absolutely well, me, not be the let case. Let me tell you a story about suffragettes, which I spent 11 years as a member of parliament, right? And so each day I went to parliament and walked around Parliament Square it was only on the day after I became mayor, there's a great woman called Caroline Criado Perez, where she was going for a jog and she was running through Parliament Square and she spotted there were 11 statues of great people, not one is a woman. So over a period of time, even somebody who's a proud feminist, who's quite progressive, who thinks he's aware of these things, we've normalised discrimination. And so Caroline began this campaign to get finally at least one statue of woman in Parliament Square. Because there were and there were men of colour there, weren't there? There was Nelson Mandela. There was, and, yeah, there's and Mandela Gandhi. and there's Gandhi. Yeah, yeah. And they, they were quite recent uh, additions to Parliament Square. But nobody had asked the question, why are there no women? Are you trying to tell me there haven't been great women? Are you trying to tell me that, you know, this country's not built on the shoulders of great women? And so Caroline's campaign, she lobbied me as the mayor day one in my job, saying, listen, we need to have a statue of a woman. And I said, yes, straight away. But that's just an example of how we've normalised this idea that only you know, men can be great people and stuff. And we're sort of immune to the casual discrimination that takes place even in the statues and monuments. Mm. So what can we do to help your vision for London? Because if we don't want to run one of the emergency services, or in fact are very much not qualified to do so, how can we play? How can we participate? What is it that you want women in London, girls in London to be doing, to join in and to be driving this? Well, the key thing we're trying to get across is aspiration and ambition. Be aspirational, be ambitious. There is, I say to my daughters, there is no job that you can't do. You know, ambition is a key thing because one of the key things I worry about is, and you must have come across this, the imposter syndrome, where people think, I'll be found out, even though they're as good, if not better, at the job than their uh, peers. So giving young people confidence is important, really, really important. Those of us who've are in decent positions, have got to give out 
provide the helping hand, be an enabler. Don't pull up the ladders that we use to reach success. Be mentors, be somebody who sponsors people like the Our Time Initiative. Make introductions, really important. You know, if you're in a room and you're the only woman or only person of colour, ask the question why. I have had a rule from day one since I became mayor. I do not share a platform unless there are women on that platform. Everyone now in City Hall understands that rule. And I'll give you an example of the difference it makes. I went on a trade mission to India and Pakistan and uh, I was doing a panel talk. And at the end, two women on the panel came up to me and said, thank you very much. I said, sure, but what for? And she goes, because your team said, they would only do this if there's a woman on the panel. We got invited on the panel. And that led to benefits to them being on that panel and stuff. So you can bring about big change by doing small things, by saying, you know what, if it's an all-male platform, you know, if it's an all-white platform, I'm not comfortable. It's, it can't be beyond the wit of you to find a woman or somebody of colour and stuff. And there are things you can do which you may think aren't big, but they have a huge impact. And finally, I read that you're spending £44 million, Sadiq, to make London safer for women and girls. What are you spending that money on? Well, let me give you some examples that you will know and your women listeners will know, but some of your male listeners may not know. For example, as a man, I'm not touched up on the tube or assaulted in a sexual way. I'm just not. And so my experiences are different to yours using the underground or using buses. As a, somebody who went to school in this city and used a bus, wearing a uniform didn't lead to perverts doing things to me or saying things to me and stuff. And so as a mayor who wants to be a mayor for everyone, I've got to recognise there are issues when you're a girl or a woman in our city. I'll give you other examples. There's a disproportionately high number of homicide victims who are the wives or girlfriends of men who kill them or the need for refugees and hostels, safe places for women to go. And what it's about is realising that the criminal justice service should be for everyone and the way the British Transport Police or TFL response should be for everyone. You should be able to have dignity and go about our city and not be harassed, molested, sexually assaulted, be the victim of domestic abuse and stuff. And it's those sorts of things we're doing. The other thing we've set up, the first in the country, is an online hate crime hub. You and I both know, I'm afraid, with the advances in social media, people are now using you know, Twitter or Facebook to actually make threats of violence and do things that are serious criminal acts and are not being acted upon. So we're doing all these sorts of things to make sure that the life of a Londoner who is a girl or woman are far better now and going forward than they have been in the past. Well, I really, really appreciate you doing that. And I know some of our listeners will think that some men and some boys do experience these things too. And we, oh, we, sure, hear, sure. we hear that and we know that. But we know that the vast majority of this violence and these sexual assaults are directed towards women. So we really appreciate you making the city safer. Is there anything that our listeners can do to help you with any of the projects that you've got this year, next year? What would you like us to be doing to participate to join in because Guilty Feminist listeners love to leave the house. We like to support, we like to hashtag, we like to go out and do things. What is it that we can do to help you? Well, the first thing is I'll share your ideas with me. This year, I've been fortunate to work with campaigners who set the bar high for challenging inequality and making change. I've worked with campaigners such as Caroline Credo Perez, who's amazing. She helped to unveil a statue in Parliament Square, Amica George, addressing period poverty and Katriana Ogilvie to support parents of premature babies. So if you've got an idea of how we can make real change for gender equality, let me know how I can support you. You can get in touch with Talk London or over Twitter. Uh, best way to reach me is at Mayor of London. Also, you can spread the word about the Our Time initiative that we've launched. This scheme is about changing the systems that hold women back at work. You can also read more about what we're doing at City Hall. We're going to share a toolkit, which will be something that you can take to your employers, something you can lead on introducing at work, or something you can help us improve on. And we can then help all women in London reach their potential. I also think we need to challenge inequality wherever we see it. I know this is easier said than done, but I'm personally inspired and motivated by others that are also pushing for gender equality. For example, Malala Yousafzai and Doreen Lawrence. Get involved. Sadiq, you have been absolutely wonderful and we love living in London. We love it. It's a wonderful city. And we know that there were great ideas for our listeners all around the world there. Thank you so much for giving us your time and thank you for being a truly feminist leader of our city. Thank you very much. I'm a feminist, but having seen Mamma Mia 2, here we go again, and really enjoying it, I did have a small moment of wondering what it would be like to have a threesome 
with young Colin Firth, played by Hugh Skinner, and old Colin Firth, played by Colin Firth. Both in character. <laughs> I mean, that would be an evening. That just sounds for the, amazing. Just for the story, but also they both are pretty cute. I only know what old Colin Firth looks like and I'm still on board. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a great time. He's well. The thing is, Hugh, I've never fancied Hugh Skinner in anything else, and I've met Hugh Skinner, and he's so cute. He's adorable and stuff, but he's like a boy. Like I just didn't see him in that night. But mm. playing the young Colin Firth, I was like, oh, I get it now. Yeah, you but can I think that. he would need the reinforcement of the old Colin Firth <laughs> to sort of really for the sex appeal. Not saying Hugh Skinner's not sexy, by the way. He's just he's sexy to young women his own age who like that sort of thing. Do you know what I mean? You have like, high it, standards. It's totally I mean, fine. I mean, he Don't doesn't find me apologize. sexy either. This is not rude of me. This is not <laughs> rude. I didn't get any vibes that he would... He would. Vibes are hard. He's, this is all in my head and Hugh Skinner is not up for this. I think it's clear. But, but in the right light, with the right music, the yeah. right drugs... <laughs> and the right older version of himself. I'm just saying Waterloo. <laughs> A good time. Wouldn't be wrong if I wanted to. Oh, I'm a feminist, but as a queer woman, when I'm looking out at uh, couples of queer women and I see there's a person who's a bit more masculine-y and like a, sometimes a bit more femme person, I'm like, who am I in that dynamic? And I'm like, I'm really attracted to the masked person, but also I want to be the masked person. And then I find myself asking, are there couples with two masked women? Ah, that's not a feminist thought, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> they it's definitely not. are. Totally. I actually, this is really sad, I was in a circle of queer women, as you do. Um, queer women what? of color, ultra, next level circle. Um, and I was circle. like, where was yeah. the circle? Was it, was, it organized? We came to see um, Hot Brown Honey. Here. Oh, yes, so, amazing. I, I like them. <laughs> yeah, they're very cool. They are them. crazy good. They're so awesome. Oh my God, they're so good. But yeah, so I was like, guys, I don't know what to do. And my friend Cassie was like, I'll help you. I found myself in this predicament as well. I'm a tomboy, and my girlfriend is quite masked, and we're living a happy life. And I was like, oh, this does exist. Epiphanies. <laughs> if you haven't seen Hot Brown Honey, by the way, holy fuck. Yeah. Political burlesque. Oh it's, my God. It, it's crazy. It's so good. I'm a feminist. But when I saw the Childish Gambino music video, This Is America, <laughs> I thought it was a powerful and provocative statement about race, state violence, and the gun lobby in the United States, and a compelling, innovative piece of artistic filmmaking that everyone should see, and also that a topless Donald Glover is fine. Ooh, fine. Ooh, tell somebody. I mean, he is, though, isn't he? He's very yeah, he's a cheeky and compelling. He's just like... Yeah. He's got this, He's magnetic. He's a complicated bird. He's my, uh, I'm a feminist, but Donald Glover is my career husband. Um, when I see my career in a man's body, it's his. Oh, that's good. My dream career. <laughs> um, I am a feminist and I'm very sex positive, but I am afraid of how many white guys I might have sex with in Edinburgh. <laughs> um, <laughs> Which, when I think about it, isn't about me slut-shaming myself, but about the fact that they're white. I thought you'd said you were veering away from white men. I know. That's why I'm afraid. I've been on a no-white-guy diet. Um, <laughs> I don't like microaggressions in the bedroom. It's not my thing. But, um, yeah, I'm really scared that I'm just going to be in this pool, this ocean. Of, of white men. Yeah, and then what if someone starts talking to me all Scottish? Oh, well, that is difficult to resist. I don't know. I've never been. I'm scared. In... I'm susceptible to accents. Listen, I'm not going to be there, but I will be your sponsor. Oh, if you thank don't, you. If you do not want to have sex with a hot, thank you. hot white Scottish man, thank you. you call me and I will talk you down from that place. I appreciate it. I will cancel it out by talking like this. I'll do an Australian <laughs> accent and I'll do lots of microaggressions over the phone I'll be like, oh, until oh, you're unaroused. unaroused. Yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> And that is how to ally people. That is how to ally. <laughs> Comedy is fun. <laughs> I'm a feminist and I'm excited to see Ocean's 8. But I wonder if the male version being Ocean's 11 is an example of the pay gap. 
Now, this is the real I'm a feminist but on that. I riffed that with another woman, and I can't remember who it was. I also can't remember if they came up with the punchline or I did. I suspect it was them. So I couldn't call them and say, can I use this? So I'm like, please, now I'm going to say it, and I'm going to say, please message me if this were you, and you did come up with a punchline so I can pay you for it. (laughs) And, yeah. Oceans, oceans, whatever, eight, eight. Interesting women of color uh, media representation. Rihanna yeah. in that was like cyber criminal. Cool. Who doesn't love to do cyber crime? Um, <laughs> and like Mindy, like I think they were both working in service roles at some point. Everyone sneaks into this event, and like most of the women are like in these really cool dresses. And, like, Mindy's like, oh, cleaning the dishes. And Rihanna's like, oh, pushing the janitor cart. I felt that about Ghostbusters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Get Leslie totally. Jones. It's so lame. She was, like, this sort of backdoor. Do you remember? Yeah, you know, Chris... sprinkle some status on my girls. Chris Rock has a bit of material where he says, I'll play any character who has keys. Because hmm. he says black guys always get the don't have any keys part. Dead, and sort of like, dead. I can get in without keys because they've all like, broken into dead, stuff all their life. Dead, dead. And he's like, if you give me keys, I will take the there. role. <laughs> <laughs> if, I, if I can open a door legally. Yeah. I don't want to push a cart. I don't I'm want doing. any roles with a cart. Mm, no it's thanks. true. <laughs> I did think that, re- that was a really standout it was interesting. part of Ghostbusters. I did think... Lame, I mean, I don't lame, blame lame, her lame. for taking it. She's offered no, like this no, huge no. Hollywood film. Oh my god! If but... someone offered me money with a cart, I would just be like, "Money." <laughs> <laughs> Do you have another one? Oh, you you bet. Let's go rate it XXX. I'm a feminist, but my porn isn't always. <laughs> Been trying to get into more guy on guy. I just feel like. That helps. Live from the BFI in London, the Spontaneity Shop presents The Guilty Feminist with me, Deborah Francis White, guest co host Pima Bob, and very special guests Yomi, Adoka K, and Elizabeth Uga Viene, talking about women of colour on screen. This is The Guilty Feminist, the podcast in which we explore our noble goals as 21st century feminists and the hypocrisies and insecurities which undermine them. Today, joining me is Kima Bob as my co-pilot, and we are talking about women of colour on screen. Yes! Uh, Important topics. Mm. So do you have any particular icons on screen for women of colour that you love? Totally. or Or you dislike? Totally. Omarosa, dislike. (laughs) She was on Donald Trump's The Apprentice and then started being with him in the White House, dislike. Understandable, understandable. I, as a, I don't know, spunky, that's a weird word, but as like a young black woman with like a lot of energy who likes to, um, I don't want to ever be too, too polished. I still want to be fun and myself. I really look up to Tiffany Haddish. I think she's so cool, such a badass. I love her so much. She does what she wants. If you Google Tiffany Haddish, what was the chat show that she did that piece on? It was like Conan or something. She did the most incredible story about going on a boat with Will Smith. (laughs) Do you know what else I loved? When she was on SNL... She hosted Saturday Night Live and she yes, was wearing the a dress. dress and the she dress. said she said something like, I wore this dress to the Golden Globes or the Emmys yeah, or something. Yeah. And she said, I know you're not meant to appear in the same dress twice, but she said, I paid yeah. thousands for this dress. Yeah. I've got to wear it every day. Exactly. She's like, what it's are like the, the dress. I'm, I'm just looking out for the next sighting of the, the dress. dress. And she's like, Yes, do you remember this from the gala? Do you remember this from the <laughs> Emmys? Like and from SNL? Like, do you remember this dress? Like I relate to that, though, because I have, like, three posh dresses that I shuffle around in a loop. Now I get to go on more red carpets. I mean, they're not the Emmys carpets, let's be incredibly clear. But you still don't have a million dollars to have a fresh dress for every carpet or rug. I do not have... (laughs) Whatever the situation. Yeah. To be fair, some of my openings are red rug openings. <laughs> and you are correct, Kima, I do not have a million tea dollars. Um. 
Hello, Guilty Feminist. It's Deborah Francis White. I just wanted to let you know there is a show in London, and some of our listeners complain they can't get tickets, that they're not available. So get in now if you would like to come to the Coliseum, the home of the English National Opera, on the 27th of November. Rachel Paris and I are doing a show about music. It's going to be a riot of a night. You've not experienced The Guilty Feminist until you've sung I Will Survive at the home of the English National Opera. It will be 10.30pm, but it's only a one-episode show, so don't worry, it won't go on forever and the tubes run late. Please book now at londoncoliseum.org. That's London, C-O-L-I-S-E-U-M dot org. It's going to be a wonderful night. Also, we are coming around the whole of the UK to do a really big tour. This is going to be an all-singing, all-dancing, really fabulous, feel-good evening of, let's be clear, feminist cabaret, feminist vaudeville. Uh, This show will not be podcast. You've got to come out for it. And if you go to guiltyfeminist.com, you can see that we should be coming to a town or a city near you. Look for the closest one. Tickets are going fast, I warn you. So get tickets now for next year or they're going to all be gone. They really are going fast. They also make great Christmas presents. And if you're living in the UK or can access BBC television, I'm going to appear on Comedy Panel Show. Have I got news for you this Friday, the 23rd of November at 9pm. See you there. If you enjoy it, don't forget to at Have I Got News on Twitter. Could you do me a favour? We really want to keep this podcast running every single Monday, including Christmas, throughout the whole year. And what that means is we need a little bit of help from you. Here's something you could do. On your phone, go to Apple Podcasts, or on your laptop, go to iTunes. Find The Guilty Feminist and rate and review a recent episode or just some recent episodes. How are you feeling about the podcast this year? You've probably reviewed it in the past, but if you could put another review for you know something recent, that would be awesome. And obviously, give it five stars, gang. If you have already read my book, could you go to amazon.co.uk and review it there? And Goodreads and review it there. This really, really helps. And I really, really appreciate you doing it. Also, buying the book really helps. If you're looking for Christmas presents this year, go and grab the book from Waterstones or another bookshop or Amazon. We'd love to see you at Global Pillage. And we have some live shows coming up at King's Place in London on the 8th of December and the 15th of December, where we're doing our Christmas special. You can get tickets for that at kingsplace.co.uk. And don't forget to listen to the episodes. The season has started at globalpillage.net. And while you're there, go and check out the new season of Grown Up Land at BBC Sounds. And finally, if you haven't yet heard the Amnesty International Guilty Feminist Secret Policeman's podcast, it is absolutely a winner. You will hear a lot of messages about human rights that are really important and actions that you can take, but also some of the most extraordinary comedy that you will hear. We have some really, really big names, some of whom you know and love from The Guilty Feminist doing new material. Some of them you won't know or you won't have heard before. And we've revived some classic sketches with some feminist spins. So please, please, please go to our feed and listen to the Secret Policeman's podcast from Amnesty and The Guilty Feminist. And now back to the show. Our guest today wrote the hit new exciting book, Slay in Your Lane, The Black Girl's Bible. Please welcome to the stage the wonderful Yomi Adokike and Elizabeth Uvabiene. Yes. So exciting. So can you just say your names into your microphones and that way we know which voice is which voice? Yeah, I'm your Mirdeg, okay? That sounded very questioning when I was... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Who is that? Yeah, I'm your Mirdeg, okay? I'm Elizabeth Uvebenene. Great. Did I pronounce your names correctly? No. Oh, God I, damn it! I, I, I don't even pronounce my name correctly. Time. I practice so hard. I know, I can see that the... I've e, done it all. D-E-G is like circled. Like, yeah, yeah. that in. You Adekake. tried very hard, but no, it was No, wrong. I've got to get it right, though. Yomi Adekake. Adeg. Adeg, okay. Adeg, okay. And did I go anywhere near you? <laughs> You've... I have a daily battle of how to say my own name. Yeah, I tell her. Well. I thought I nailed that one. 
So firstly, before we get on to deconstructing the film, tell us a little bit about Slay in Your Lane, the Black Girl's Bible. What brought you to write it and what should we expect when we read it? Slay in Your Lane came about because Elizabeth called me one day on a lunch break and was literally like, we always say the story sounds like far too marketable. Like, two best friends, oh my God. And one of them wanted to get ahead at work, so she called her other best friend and like Aww. literally was like, how do I do it? And I was like, I'll help. And that quite literally is exactly what happened is in she pitched an idea to me and was like, you know, we always kind of joke about the fact that like we're Nigerian girls, so everything's kind of got like a pound sign somewhere. We're like, oh, wait, how do we make this work? Like, you know, in terms of money. <laughs> so she was like, I want to essentially get ahead in the workplace. She read loads of books like Lean In and like Girl Boss and all these books that were kind of like white women in shiny suits being like, this is how you do it. And then it's like, but how do you do it when you're not a white woman in a shiny suit? So she was like, I'm not a white woman in a shiny suit. So how do I actually thrive in the workplace? And then essentially she was like, can you write me this book? <laughs> and tell me how to thrive in the workplace. And I was like, I don't know how to thrive in the workplace <laughs> because no. I'm 23. So not now, but we were 22 and 23 at the time. So this is mostly a work guide. And yeah, I've looked no. through it. I haven't read it all yet, but I have looked through it. And it started out mostly as a work guide. Yeah. yeah. So but the it, first conversation was like, oh, work. And then it expanded into so many different areas. So education, dating, health. And that's why it's essentially called the Black Girl Bible. Because yeah. we tried to pack in a lot in there. Yeah, yeah. out there. <laughs> And do you find the experience of... Because you interviewed a lot of people for this yeah. book, didn't you? Were you able to find sort of common themes and threads that where a lot of black women felt they had a different experience from other women and particularly white women in work and dating and that kind of thing? Were there any common themes I that Kima would relate to? I'm black American, you this guys. This is what I'm I was going to say. Black British. But... You're a moment away from a microaggression, Deborah. I'm like, oh, we're different. You see the difference? <laughs> I was just trying to be a good host and bring Kima in. Yeah, yeah. So I was like, the oh, Kima I gotta would to. lean in and be a girl boss, but I know how to slay in my lane. Wow, wow. That was good. she's gonna throw it away later. But that was brilliant. <laughs> but yeah, there were loads of things in terms of like our oldest interviewee is seventy three, and our youngest is twenty seven, and basically it was literally same shit, different decade essentially. Oh, like God, that's sadly, so there was loads of positive things, and we can't lie and be like, oh my God, everything's exactly the same. Otherwise, this book wouldn't exist because mm. everyone would be like it's black so no but mm. things obviously have moved on quite a bit but definitely there was a lot of kind of like in 1945 and then in 1965 and then in 1985 mm. there was a lot of kind of repeated like bullshit that they all kind of went through essentially. like what sort of things I suppose within the black community western beauty standards kind of prevailing so yeah. there being a general kind of preference for whiteness not just outside of the black community but within mm. our own community mm. so whether you're in Brixton or whether you're literally in Nigeria it's like there's still a preference for white people a little lighter um, yeah exactly it's colorism stuff like that I think the themes like there's subtle nuances between what it means to be a black British woman and what it means to be a black American woman I didn't grow up here. Um, so entering the workplace, I'm coming in like double blind. It's amazing. <laughs> uh, but yeah, Do you it's think that helps, Kima? Because when you don't know the culture, you sort of bypass some of the structural It helps bias. me and how I move definitely because I think it's how a tourist looks in a certain place, right? You can kind of tell when someone has been on the street a million times and when they haven't. Mm -hmm. And I think for the past two years, I've just been like, oh, wow. <laughs> um, and I think you can kind of feel that vibe. Yeah. But yeah. I do know what you mean because I think coming here from Australia as well, I didn't know, like, I wouldn't have known that the national theatre was impenetrable. Yeah. So I might have turned up and said, any workshops I can be in? Dude, you know? I went to the, I think it was the Museum of Comedy or something like that. And I was like, y'all do open mics. And he was like, no, sweetie. Yeah. <laughs> but you don't ask, you don't get. And there are certain yeah. things that I think with British people, you do get, the longer I'm here, the more I get to understand. That's your place in the hierarchy. Don't get out of it. And mm. of course, when you don't know what the hierarchy is, it's much easier yeah. just to go. Yeah. You just knock on, all the doors look the same. Yeah. Who do you look to as positive role models in fiction? of black women on screen? Oh, the positive bit is, can be a bit conflicting. I think at the moment, we're really excited around watching Insecure, oh, the third season. Um, I love Insecure so much. Being two best friends and seeing that dynamic, that's very, yeah. very interesting because you don't yeah. really see that often, like that yeah. friendship. And they're both imperfect. There is no like, oh, this person's good and then like Issa mm -hmm. is great, mm -hmm. but they balance each other out quite well. Yeah. I have to say, you said in the dressing room, you told me some terrible news that yeah. I was then I just had to come out on stage and pretend nothing was wrong. Yeah. 
They told me Lawrence was leaving and he wasn't going to be back for season three. Yeah, Do you guys watch this? Clearly it's a not. Oh, yeah. not. Oh, he's sad. <laughs> clearly yeah. not. Clearly oh. not. Yeah, yeah that's all. Yeah, I'm, I'm a feminist, into, into but we like Lawrence because you're. If you are a feminist, you're not really supposed to like Lawrence, are you? It's just oh. so. <laughs> he's a bit. I of a dick. don't. Come on. I like the flood. No. I like the flood male dynamic, and I don't. It's you know a lot of people are like men are trash, and I think Lawrence is just like yeah sometimes. <laughs> I'm like yeah, but then he tries to bounce back, and I think it's interesting to see. You know what? It's just a complicated relationship. <laughs> Lawrence has had as many difficult things done to him oh, as he true. has done. You do agree on me. You I do defend him. Yeah. I defend him to the death. And he is, my, but I'm a feminist, you he know. Is Still, also, the two work. He is exquisitely hot. <laughs> exactly, which is Sexual. a big part of the defense. He's, he's very good looking. <laughs> he is he very is, good looking. He makes me cry. He's so hot. <laughs> and I, I mean, he is somebody. <laughs> he is somebody who, when he takes his shirt off, it's actually the moment. It's actually a little bit disconcerting. And the lighting in that show is so good as well. So the melanin is just popping and I'm just like, oh. Everyone oh, looks agree. glistening. You and yes. moisturise. Nice Sometimes clip. I think you shouldn't look directly at Lawrence with his shirt off, much like an eclipse. <laughs> <laughs> There's something. It's not right. He is too Ball beautiful. Too but listen, I feel like Issa Rae, she had her... You know, it's just a two-way street. They're both flawed and imperfect people. Yeah. Yes, And he that's has. what's so cool about the show, you guys, because we're talking about who they are as people and not some weird other aspect of that. It's mm. just about what they're doing yeah. and their relationship and the life that they're living. I went to see a film called The Amazing Jessica James, and in it uh, starred Jessica... Williams. Williams. Oh, so obsessed. And it's basically just like a rom-com... And I saw the Q&A afterwards. It was on a Sundance here. And um, the director she said... She was there? Was she there? Yes. You guys, you were breathing in the same area? I chatted to her. Wow. I asked I asked her to do the podcast. And she oh said to God. get in touch. And oh then I did. God. And then she never got back to me. It was... it was Classic Jessica. <laughs> she will. She will get back to me. She just... No, she did not get back to me. I think her people got back to me and she wasn't in town. Oh, my God. When you get the people involved, it's so dramatic. I'm always on those red carpets. I know. It's like a movie where she is a black woman, but that's not the main thing about her. That's not how she's yeah. identified the whole time. And it's time. a thing, but it's not the whole thing. Yeah. yeah. And it's afterwards, Susan McComa, we'd seen it together, and then afterwards she just went, you know, like a movie where like the, you just go and see a movie sometimes about a guy and he buys pizza and then he drops it on the ground and then a bird starts eating it and he looks at it and he's sad and he gets on the subway and then he's still thinking about that pizza and that bird and what mm. it means in his life. And then she went on like that, I swear to you, for like 20 minutes. Mm. And then she looked at me and she said, I want to be in a movie like that. Yeah. I want to be in a movie yeah. where that happens to a black woman, where yeah. nothing happens to a black woman, but she just gets to contemplate the world. Yeah. Are you hungry for that, to see that represented on screen? Yeah, I think 100%. Yeah, like... I think it's happening on the small screen. I mean, I mean, you've got chewing gum, which is just like mm. yeah, a brilliant. Yeah. Don't smoke it all. Which Susan about... McComber is in? Yes, she is. She's also in our book. If you anybody wanted to know that, yes, yes, yes. yes. She's totally in my book as well. Oh my god, oh my god. I love wow. this. So just like wink, wink. If anybody <laughs> needed to know, and Susan. she's in my Twitter. <laughs> 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 when is Susie McComber going to write her own book? Is she just like expressing her views through the medium of yeah. interviews? Yeah. Incrementally. Like, oh, write a book. Okay, she gets to write her own book. Clearly. Exactly. Um, but yeah, I think Chewing Gum is definitely on the small screen a good example of just a normal... I mean, okay, no. Tracy not normal. is not normal. <laughs> An abnormal, she's quirky, she's yeah, quirky, quirky she's black girl, girl losing her virginity, yeah. and which is just so like juxtaposed against like the general hypersexualization of black women. Anyway, she's just this yeah, dorky, yeah, yeah. awkward black woman. So literally, again, that whole black people are so cool. It's like no, they're not. not Here's fam. Michaela Cole, <laughs> like, gunning. But, yeah. Although I did, and please tell me if this is a microaggression. I took my niece to Paris Disneyland. I did stand there and think, I want to be as cool as a black French family at Disneyland <laughs> waiting to get on the Dumbo ride. <laughs> like, just look so Did cool. Did everyone have berets and sunglasses? No, they just were cool. What I made them cool? It. <laughs> They're just attitude and everything. Yeah. Yeah. Say, black French people are it's definitely cool. So oh that's like the one God. instance where it's not a microaggression. That's a solitary like, okay. instance I because they are very cool. cool. They are. 
as that family. Yeah, that's what I thought. I want to be the whole family. They just like double. their accents. It's cool square. Oh, this is, this man is alive. Move into was, a microaggression. Uh, I have to we're interject. Getting close. We're getting close. <laughs> Are we getting oh, close to an idea? I have to interject as oh, a microaggression I, queen. I have yes, to come, come, come ding in. What's the microaggression part of that? Just they may definitely think it's not the case that they're everyone's calls. Like the African yeah. American thing, we all think that they always. I'm so complicit. Cool. I was like, oh, don't listen to Elizabeth. <laughs> it's it's so cool. Is it because it's comedy? It's because it's when. You, yeah. like, it's like when you joke about something and you know that some people will understand that you're kidding around, but then also it's like, well, everyone understands that you're kidding around. And then you feel like you have to be like, by the way, that's not okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Which is nearly, nearly all comedy now. Hello, Guilty Feminists. This is Jessica Regan here. I'm coming to Birmingham on the 1st of December to give my big speeches workshop at the Birmingham Rep. Places are limited, so please book now to avoid disappointment. We have a few subsidised places that we prioritise for the unwaged and for students, but we do try and accommodate anyone in need. I'm looking forward to seeing you all there. Welcome to the stage, the wonderful Kima Bob! Uh, uh, oh, yes. Thank you. Thanks, guys. So we're talking about women of color on screen. I'm a black American, which is a fun place to be as a person. Yeah, it's really interesting because black Americans are represented in media so much that people who haven't met black people think that's what black people are. Like, people just assume that everyone's easy e from straight out of Compton. <laughs> like, people walk up to me so much, and they'll be like, oh, where are you from? And I'm like, America. And they're like, yo! No. <laughs> no. Not for me. No, thank you. <laughs> and it's really interesting, because, like, there's so many different kinds of black people, so many different kinds of black women. But we see the same stuff a lot, you know? And it makes it seem like everyone is from one area, one single block. You know, someone was talking to me the other day, my flatmate from Singapore, and he was like, yeah, because black Americans aren't like a monolith, right? And I was like, what is this question? In order for all black Americans to be the same, there would have to be one of us. <laughs> Just doesn't make sense. Um, yeah, so I was watching Orange is the New Black the other day. Oh, it's so... It just tears me apart. Part of me is like, oh, man, this is so, like, offensive. But, like, I'm like, also, damn, the plot, though. Like, where is this going to go? You know? Like, I'm like, oh, I hate a prison gang war. Oh, I hate to see a race war. But I really want to see how close the younger version of this character looks to the current version. <laughs> They're doing really good casting with that. It's out of control. But, like, in the back of my head, I'm like, these could be real women in prison. <laughs> also, let's just talk about Piper Chapman for a moment. White women, is that good media representation for you guys? <laughs> what Piper Chapman does is a verb that I call white womaning. Uh, it's when you get so lost in like privilege and your own self that your humanity falls to the side. <laughs> Don't white women, white women. Don't white women. I think it's really interesting watching Steph because in the past like few years. Uh, I feel like people on TV and in film have been trying to make up for the lack of positive representation. Uh, and so what they do is just, like, sprinkle a little status on it. And they're just like, oh, what? The past has been negative? Check it out. Black doctor. Bam. Ooh, lawyer. What? You think that guy is a drug dealer? Psych. He's undercover. He's the police. <laughs> Boom. Black people on top. It's fixed now. It's really interesting. Like, everybody has to have such a, like, crazy fun job. Like, I'm like, where's the interior decorator? You know what I'm saying? Where's that person? Where's that movie? Is her life not interesting? <laughs> not downtrodden enough for you? Ah. <sighs> Good times, great times. I want to see a version, not Freaky Friday, like that I Feel Pretty movie, the Amy Schumer. They didn't want to see I Feel Pretty. So dumb, so dumb. <laughs> the whole jest is like this woman who, nothing's wrong with her, has low self-esteem, and then she hits her head, and she thinks she's someone she's not. 
and it's called I Feel Pretty. I want to do a version like that called I Feel White, um, <laughs> where a black person hits their head and wakes up completely unaware to structural racism. <laughs> <laughs> Good times. If you're listening at home, we started with a short film, and it was called All of Me, and you can find it on the British Film Institute archive. It's about a 15-minute film. And so we're just going to put it through the Slay in Your Lane filter now, because we want to know what the Slay in Your Lane authors thought of it. It started with a young... Was she a young mixed-race woman? Uh, yeah. yeah, it started based off of that mum, I'd say. <laughs> <laughs> it started with a young mixed race woman, and uh, she was singing in a club. She looked very cool. It cut between that and her being at the doctor, being told that uh, she had leukemia and she needed a bone marrow transplant and it was better from her family. Did she have anyone in her family? And she said no in an ominous fashion and let us know that she was estranged from her family. Mm -hmm. Part two, she goes to visit her family. Her mother opens the door. She is, in fact... White. Thank you. (laughs) And so what did you think? What were your impressions of this film? I thought it was... You know what? For How long was it? Like eight minutes? Mm. But however, fifteen. I oh, think. okay. <laughs> wow. Which, so yeah, I don't. I have a mean, good if you think that it was eight minutes, then it, that sounds like it was good. <laughs> yeah, time flies when you're yeah. having fun. Mm. I thought it was really good, honestly. Like for how short it was, not as short as I thought, but <laughs> for how mm. short it was, I did think it was good. I thought the representation was varied and multifaceted, and very kind of um, yeah, different. And I liked it. I liked seeing a gender non-conforming woman of color on screen. Mm. I liked the fact that. She was obviously hiding her emotions, but then it wasn't kind of like this stoic depiction of black women, which mm-hmm. is like, we don't show mm-hmm. our emotions because we don't have them. It was like, I am being forced because of like mm-hmm. patriarchy and mm-hmm. racism to be strong all the time. So you could, they literally mm-hmm. zoomed in on like, look at her holding back her tears. She wishes that she mm-hmm. could be vulnerable, but she She can't. has them. <laughs> she has them. That's exactly <laughs> it. So yeah, I thought it was really good and I thought it was... Interesting. What did you think of the gender non-conforming piece? Because on stage she had sort of an androgynous look Mm. that was kind of like a Bowie type look. And then when she turned up at the house, her nephew said, you look like a boy. He couldn't really remember her. And he said, in that childish way, he sort of said, you look like a boy. And she said, well, what are you talking about? You're wearing a cat suit. And he was, to be fair, dressed up. Yeah, he's also, he was like four or five. He wasn't like a teenage nephew in a cat suit. (laughs) <laughs> that changes the image being for ignorant listeners. as well. Yeah. Yeah. And she, he said, oh, it's a badger suit. And she started to bond with him. But then later, her mother said, oh, people will think I have a son. She had a lot of accusation about having um, male gender expression. That where... pinged me a little bit, um, just being a person who my mom's always like, put some earrings on. You look like a little boy. And I'm like, with no earrings? <laughs> oh, what about these titties, though? But like... <laughs> <laughs> It's just really interesting. But yeah, that kind of like hit me there because it's interesting uh, when parents are all like, I mean, they're real big. Um, I, I saw on Twitter the other day, you said your mother had described you. She told me I dressed like an old white lesbian. And I was like, old white? Well, yeah, and then I do a, a comedy show monthly called uh, Films of Color. And she goes, I mean, your show's called Films of Color, not Butchers of Color. And I was like, Jesus, two for two. She writes my comedy. <laughs> do you think there's a different stereotype? that? Because I don't think I've seen that played out. I think black women are often fetishized or overly sexualized on screen. Mm. Did that add an extra element for you? Is that something you recognize or something that you thought, oh, that's a particular dimension to that writer? It made me think I want to know more because like Mm. you said, you don't tend to really see it, especially for women of color. So it piqued my interest a lot. Dude, the fact that she was even in a band or like in that setting, because there are black women in those settings, but I feel like they're often one of few. I went to a thing recently, and it was like Girls Rock London, which is this organization that helps people get into music. They're super cool if anyone wants to. You don't need experience. But their guitar teacher or like bass teacher, she teaches stuff. I don't know. This 
awesome black woman named Stella. And I was just like, I don't know. I was there for it at first and I was like enjoying the music, but I saw like Stella up there. I was like, fuck, I want to play something. Like it's just something cool about seeing someone with a body similar to yours doing something that reminds you that like you can be there, mm. you know? And so even in that instance of this girl just like, killing the bass. I don't know what instruments are, but now I want to play one. It was amazing. Mm. Slapping the bass. I liked that because when the first image was her in a band, I did think there's that sort of stereotype of black women in music, yeah. mm. but it didn't play into that stereotype. And she had masculine gender expression, but she had a boyfriend. So she was mm. clearly straight or bisexual or pansexual. Mm. In general, was there anything that you thought, ah, that's a sort of message that I would tell that character or anything from the book around gender expression or anything like that that you think is unpacked further in your book? I think the one thing that stuck out generally was about black women feeling unable to be vulnerable, I suppose. Mm. That's something that we talk about a lot, like mental health and like feeling that like shedding a solitary tear means that like you're the weakest link. And that's not something that like we've decided that we want to do because it's so fun. It's more because we feel like we have to essentially just continually be strong mm all the time even with the whole Ghostbusters you know she's like I'm street smart I'll show you the yeah. way like it's that kind mm. of like that's what we're supposed to do be the people that kind of like keep things going and because like... things it, it feels like things keep going um, and historically you don't really see a lot of uh black women just like crying anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> I did this workshop and it was like who do you feel is entitled to tears and it's like not always myself Mm. You know, it's really interesting. And tears can be weaponized and all sorts. But yeah, I think it's just interesting the difference of like, say, what would happen on the street or in like an instance where a white woman cries, uh, where a woman of color, a black woman cries. Mm. Um, yeah. I mean, they're called white tears for a reason. <laughs> black tears doesn't quite have the same sip, ring sip. to it because it's just not as prevalent. There's not enough of them in the cup. Exactly. How am I supposed to <laughs> drink the black out. tears and I'm the cup? <laughs> Exactly. Yeah, I do know what you mean. I feel like if white women cry as a white woman, there will be a certain amount of automatic. Dude, if I could have a sympathy. superpower, yeah. it would probably be uh, white woman tears. And then whenever I just felt in trouble or in doubt or like I needed help, I would just cry and things would happen. Something happened. And I'd call the police I... for fun. <laughs> I admit I can do all of those things, and it is, it is a, like a magic lasso. Oh my I'm gosh! Sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. It's true though. It's true. Like I, I admit it. It's true. Like if I cry, people will run around me, and if I'm in trouble, I can run towards law enforcement. Mm. And mm. wouldn't think twice about it. Mm. By the way, wouldn't think twice about running yeah. towards a police officer, and every day become more acutely aware of what a privilege that is and uh, ways it's in which so I can. It's so weird. Uh, police are weird, but that's not what we're here to talk about. No. <laughs> that's a whole show. <laughs> that's a whole other show. Police are weird. Next time you come back, Kima Bob. Listen, uh, let's police the th love them, but we've got to have some words. <laughs> <laughs> we can make that the theme of the next show. Is there anything else you'd like us to know about your book before we close the show? It's or out. Yeah. It's out. Where can it's we buy available. it? Literally everywhere. It wasn't available on WH Smith till literally about 10 minutes ago. And then oh. Elizabeth sent me a frantic WhatsApp. Like, they fuck, they buckled. Yeah. So it's out there now. <laughs> they've buckled. They've buckled. Yeah. Were they holding out? Apparently it's so. It's hard to get in WH Smith. Yeah. So you've And now we're there. Yeah. I'm just going to go into WH Smith's and cry until they put it on the shelves. <laughs> <laughs> it should work. It should work. <laughs> I haven't even heard. I've got a book. I've got it. WH is to write. I just I'm so, I'm so upset. I'm so upset. Piper Chapman. This is what I'm talking about, you guys. That's what I'm talking about. I mean, I, I don't know what to tell you, Piper oh. Chapman. She's one of my people. I apologize. She's one of my people. Um, Can I say what? I'm excited about the book? Yes. Okay, I'll tell you why. Because I haven't read, but I really want to. Because I was looking up some stuff about it online, and it was talking about the unwritten rules that you come into when you come into a space. And how there are some things that I feel like a lot of people are brought up maybe knowing or have access to certain information, whether it be through like connections or not. I think there are a lot of gaps that I find myself as a black woman, you know, with my parents or whatever. A lot of gaps I find myself having to bridge myself. 
whether it be uh, giving myself a better financial education or figuring out how to network. I didn't even know what internships were until I was in college. Yeah. And, like, my mom, she just didn't say anything. Like, she has, like, two degrees. She just does, was just like, what? <laughs> yeah, so there's so many things that I feel like not everyone knows, and I think that's taken for granted. But, yeah, I'm excited about this book, talking about um, the different things that people run into. And you guys were saying that it's useful for everyone, um, not just black women, because it can help other people ally better by better understanding uh, the black female experience. Mm. So I guess what I'm saying is take your ass to Waterstones. And WH Smith Or now. WH Smith. <laughs> yes, yes. So Online, um, in the internet. The was, internet. Um, yes. Um, I was reading my book today for the audiobook. I was reading a section out about how Hollywood has done us a great disservice. Harry Potter is for everyone. The worst mm. witch is only for girls. And mm. that happens a lot. So I think this is the Black Girls Bible and we should all read it because we all need to get better at looking out of other people's eyes. If we are straight to watch, read and experience through queer eyes, if we are not disabled to watch and experience and read through disabled eyes and if we are especially white that we look especially through... Especially white. Especially white. If we're, I mean, I am especially white. Actually, I'm not, pretty, yeah. I'm not especially white at the moment because I've had regular. a spray tan. Oh, but, that's amazing. <laughs> but uh, normally I'm especially white. I mean, whoever we are, it's not unuseful to look through things from a young black women's perspective at the moment. So I'm going to buy it and read it. And I recommend that all guilty feminists buy a copy and read it. I also want to show publishers that these young women who are so self-starting and extraordinary and expressive and brave are the kind of authors that they should be publishing and they will be rewarded financially if they do. Oh, I got chills. So what I'm saying is even if you don't intend to read it, buy it because <laughs> it comes up just the same for the publishers mm -hmm. and you will have people who you have to go and take Christmas presents to this year just give everybody slay in your lane Boom. but I feel also Here you go, Nana, you know, I'm going to learn the from the Black Girls it. Bible <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> oh thanks tea and crumpets I'm British <laughs> hi Uncle Eric <laughs> happy Christmas <laughs> But listen, Uncle Eric, he needs to slay in his lane too. He and does. There will be lots of, just the way that a black woman can watch It's a Wonderful Life and go, oh, what if I hadn't been born? Oh. Uncle yeah. Eric can get a lot out of this in terms of his way of taking up space. <laughs> Uncle Eric is going to love it. I'm telling you. He's going to be like, I learned a lot. And you know what? No one can touch my hair either. Um, <laughs> all right. <laughs> Uncle Eric's bald and he doesn't like it when people do that. Like, it's not fair. Uh, okay. You're a treat. <laughs> Thank you, Kima Bob. You have been listening to The Guilty Feminist with me, Deborah Francis White, guest co host Kima Bob, and our very special guests, Yomi, a decorative, and Elizabeth, who The recording engineer was Grandula Zimbra. The music was by Mark Hodge. The producer was Tom Selinski for the Spontaneity Shop. Thanks to Tony and Hannah at PBJ Live and everyone at the BFI, as well as all of you for listening. For more information about this and other episodes, visit guiltyfeminist.com. Thank you very much. That's our show. I've been Deborah Francis White. Good night. Yeah. Yeah. A good time. Wouldn't be wrong if I wanted to. Oh. <laughs> Waterloo. <laughs> Waterloo. La, 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 la. <laughs> no, you don't know the words. I'm not a very mama mia. I'm a hell of my my. Is that not how it goes? You're Gen Z. You don't know any of the words. You do another one. Phenomenal. Um...